Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Today, I won't be talking so much about the global labor supply chains. I thought, because it's a photography event, I should take you out on a journey to some of the places that I've had the chance of going out and seeing. Um, I've had the absolute joy of being to Antarctica four times, and um, I thought I'd take you around for seeing how a three-month summer uh, goes through in the southern hemisphere. In the beginning of summer is December when the sun is at its winter equinox, uh, winter solstice. And when you first head down to Antarctica, this is what you see. It's the sea surface melting with ice and what you see is drift ice. And as you get closer to the continent, you have icebergs which are fed out from all the glaciers around the main continent. This photograph is on the western edge of the Ross Sea, which is where these mint white icebergs are being fed into the Antarctic ecosystem. And they'll spend decades using the circumpolar current to go round. And in that period, they'll take on beautiful hues of, of blues and whites. Um, this is an, a tabular iceberg that's, that's fallen over on its side. The tabular section is usually one-seventh of what you end up seeing and six-sevenths of it is underwater, and that's mainly the hard ice um, of this one. This iceberg, actually, what we're seeing is history, because each of those layers of blue and white represent what the CO2 concentration in air was at one point in time, and that's what given that layer of ice a particular color. Um, that's another iceberg. It's just over the years, they keep, their form keeps degrading, and they, as they decay, they throw up these lovely forms and colors, and they're just an everyday occurrence where you end up seeing a lot of icebergs. That's more icebergs, just as they decay, they take on these lovely colors of blues and shapes, and it's a real uh, pleasure to be able to see them there. Just more photographs of icebergs going through, and then, of course, the marine life there. Antarctica in the summer season is, is really special because it's when the krill is able to come up to the surface, and obviously you have the visiting whales coming in. This is a pair of humpback whales by the pack ice. Um, another humpback whale breaching in Antarctica. This is a fin whale, which is the world's second largest animal. It's the second largest animal to have ever lived. Uh, this is a juvenile minke whale that came right up to the ship and was around us for an hour, uh, seeing what we were and, and what we were up to. Very curious. This is a part of orcas. It's a very rare ecotype D orca, which is part of the first instances that it was photographed in a large pod in the wild. Um, that's a leopard seal coming out from the ice and then relaxing in the sun. It's the summer months. It's come out from a harsh winter. And as the sun moves south, it's got the, it's got the weather to sit and enjoy the time on the ice. This is Cape Adair. Uh, back in 1901, this part of Antarctica saw the first wintering of uh, a, a human expedition. It was a Norwegian team that spent some time here. And it also happens to be the largest rookery of Adelie penguins, about two and a half lakh pairs of Adelie penguins live on this uh, piece of land. And the two brown structures at the back actually are the heritage sites of the cabins that were used by the Norwegian team 115 years ago. That's a wandering albatross. They breed for life. They're born on the sub-Antarctic islands, and then they spend their life swimming around the, around the Antarctic continent. Uh, and they're down there as well. As we get into late January and February, the sun begins to start head up north again. And you have a few hours of darkness. But because of the low latitudes, about 70, 75 degrees south, you end up having these long twilight hours where the sun takes about two to three hours to set and then takes two or three hours to rise again. And on the days that it's not gray, it throws up these amazing hues of ambers and oranges and yellows. And then slowly it gets back to being all day again. That's a screen grab from a video, but that's the southern lights. So as we get into February, where the darkness is more, uh, the South Pole magnetizes the air. And then you get these lovely aurora australis, or the northern lights are the aurora, aurora borealis. Um, and getting into March, then you have the seawater that's freezing again. And this is the ice forming on the surface of the ocean again. And then as you get towards the end of March, the sun is already at the equator. It's moving up north again. And the seawater is really beginning to freeze um, over. And that's generally what 
a summer in Antarctica looks like. During this time, I've had the chance to go down on a marine conservation vessel and look at this beautiful continent from a perspective that shows just how much of life is thriving in these remote corners. And what's even more fascinating is to stand on the deck of your ship to feel the biting cold in your face and to know that all the life there and all this landscape has existed there for centuries, even before humanity came out from the caves, all of this was still happening. But then something happened. We did come out of our caves and we got onto ships and we started heading south. This is a boat called the Petrel. It's been run aground in South Georgia since 1959. It's a whaling ship. It was built in 1928 and at the peak of industrial whaling, which was when whaling ships from Australia, from America, from Europe, from the Soviet Union, went down south to harpoon whales for their blubber. The oil was used in machinery, it was used for various products, it was used for burning as oil. To consider how much the extent of industrial whaling was, in 1939, 29,000 blue whales were harpooned in Antarctica. A blue whale, on an average, weighs 150 tons, and its tongue is the size of an elephant. It's the largest animal that has ever lived. It dwarfs the dinosaurs. This one was part of that industrial whaling era, when the year after that, in 1940, the highest number of whales were taken from Antarctica. That number stood at 46,039 whales. In a period of three to four months, that's the number of whales we took out from this ecosystem. And then, this is a photo from 2014. It's a more developed and a more recent whaling vessel. It's a vessel that is owned by the Japanese whaling fleet, the Institute of Cetacean Research. And every summer, even this summer in December, this ship will head down to Antarctica and it will harpoon a certain number of whales. But because there's been a moratorium on commercial whaling introduced in 1982, that whaling will now un un be done under the guise of research. That's the photograph of a painting done by a friend of mine. It's an Antarctic toothfish. An Antarctic toothfish is an apex predator. They're the sharks of the deep. They live about two to four kilometers under the surface of the Antarctic ecosystem and they regulate the health of that frigid, deep, vulnerable ecosystem. Unfortunately, there's a legal industry which from the 80s fishes for 25,000 tons of toothfish. This is incidentally also the world's most expensive fish. It's sold commercially as Chilean sea bass and in seafood restaurants like the Oberoi's and the Taj and various fancy restaurants, you'll find this delicacy. It retails for about $500 a kilo on the market. Alongside the legal market, because Antarctica is a place that's remote and where there's hardly any enforcement, there's a full-fledged black market that runs alongside for this fish as well. This is the Euphasia superba, which is a really fancy name for a tiny animal. It is the most abundant life form in Antarctica. It feeds the seabirds, it feeds the penguins, it feeds the orcas, it feeds the toothfish, and in fact, it's the only reason why the whales even come down to Antarctica. When the ice melts in summer, the krill come up to the surface and the whales come down to feed on them, to nourish their young and to feed after the long migration down south. Sadly, the krill today also feed farmed salmon in Norway and they also feed fish farms across China and most of the world. After 1.3 million whales were taken out from Antarctica during the industrialized era of whaling, there's an industry that now thinks there's an excess of krill in Antarctica and takes and sets a quota of 620,000 tons of krill. These krill either end up as fish food or they're pressed and their oil is used for human health because apparently it's really good for you to consume krill oil. Antarctica's got a lot of beauty in it and yet, it seems to be overrun with commercial exploitation and there's a deep economic interest that is operating at every level. It's got the whales, it's got the toothfish, it's got the krill. It seems resource extraction is what's very common in this pristine ecosystem. So what's the situation in the rest of the world's oceans? This is a place that we photograph, that we visit, that we love and that we can see there's active beauty. But what about the rest of the ocean that perhaps doesn't have the same characteristics? This is just a graph that shows the major fish catchers of the world. 
As you can see, China, Indonesia, the European Union, United States, and Peru are the world's biggest catchers of fish today. Between them, all the countries, that's the amount of fish we take from the world's oceans every single year. That number stands at 93 million tons, so that's the number of zeros. Every single year, industrial fishing fleets, coastal fishing vessels, coastal fishermen go out, lay their lines, and that's the amount of fish that we get out from the world's oceans. So let's, take an, let's, let's compare the data of some of the world's biggest fishing nations and see how they get the fish. So Peru was one of the biggest catches. It catches about 7% of the world's catch. This was what was the extent of its fishing fleet in 1980. This is what it expanded to in 2010. This was America back in 1980. By 2010, this is how America was fishing. This was China back in 1980. And this is how China fishes today. The extent of industrial fishing has meant that every single fishing vessel leaves their shores and travels to the other end of the world. This extent, just take a look at it. There's fishing vessels up in the Arctic. There's fishing vessels down in the Antarctic. They're in the Pacific. They're in the Indian Ocean. They're in the South Atlantic. They're just not in the North Atlantic, because that's where the European Union and America are. But every single place is overrun with fishing vessels. And to see how this fishing is regulated, one has to get through this maze of acronyms. A lot of the international fishing in the world's oceans today is regulated purely on voluntary codes of conducts and just based on good behavior with the understanding that everybody should be able to self-regulate that fishery. There's no enforcement out there and there's very lack governance. And because of that, we've ended up with a situation that's very precarious. And these are some of the major fisheries issues today. They're exploitative. The latest UNFAO report states that 9 out of 10 fish, or 90% of the fish stocks today are exploited or overexploited. They're steeped in bad practices, which means out when no one's watching, where there's no enforcement, catch is being dumped, there's wastage, sharks are being finned, records are being fudged, transponders are being tur turned off, penalties are being avoided. Basically, what happens out there stays out there. You really don't have an idea of what's happening inside. The bad business model. Now, because vessels are traveling halfway across the world, the only thing that allows them to do that is the ability to be subsidized. So taxpayer money, your money, taxpayer money across the world is pumped into these vessels to send them across the world. There's cost cutting, which means the vessels are substandard, they sink all the time. And more importantly, there's a big issue with labor. There's trafficking of people. People who end up on the fishing vessels very often end up getting abused to extreme degrees. There's instances of rapes, murders being very common. I've met people who've been thrown over the side for not being able to fish the right way, or if they've fallen over accidentally, the vessel just hasn't stopped to pick them up. They've just gone on fishing. The vessels, for example, also stay out sometimes for four to five years at a time. So a man who gets onto a fishing vessel does not come back home for four to five years at a time. The catch is just sent by refrigerated ships back to land. And along with this, in a place where there's very lax jurisdiction, there's instances of money laundering, there's drug running, gun running, tax evasion, all of this to the scale that from 2014, Interpol has now got into environmental crime, specifically fisheries, and now fishing crime is reclassified as transnational organized crime. It's transnational because it covers the whole planet, it covers the high seas, which are areas without any jurisdiction, and it's got allied activities which just don't start with putting a hook in the water. They include tax running, tax evasion, money laundering. There's instances of shark carcasses off the coast of Central America being carved open, stuffed with drugs, and then left out in international waters when they are picked up by other vessels and then run off to America. That's the scale of what's happening out there all under the guise of fishing. So there's a lot of documentation that we do of the beauty of wildlife, but there's a few things that don't necessarily make it back to the public domain. For example, that harpoon ship that we saw in the start, under the guise of research, Japan since 1994, when the Southern Ocean was declared as a whale sanctuary, has taken 20,000 whales. The whales are taken, harpooned by an explosive grenade being fired, fired into their backs, uh, we've seen a whale take 22 minutes and 18 seconds to die. And after that, after 18 minutes, it was shot with a shotgun with six bullets to finally put it out of its misery. It was this very vessel that whale was tied up to the side. 
The whales are then transferred onto a factory ship where they are then processed for their meat. Um, these are whales, three minke whales in Antarctica, which have been put onto the Nishin Maru, which is their factory ship. And then this is the science. You can see there's a jawbone of a whale right in the middle, the cuts of meat at the other end, the discards being thrown over the side, and the scientists that we see are armed with nothing more than flensing knives and blades. This is the Thunder, one of the vessels that was fishing illegally in Antarctica for 10 years for toothfish, or the Chilean sea bass. This vessel is estimated to have made 60 million American dollars in profits over 10 years of fishing illegally. This is some of the way it caught the world's most expensive fish. The sharks of the deep from Antarctica were pulled up from those depths using gill nets. Gill nets stand about 25 kilometers in length, and they stand about 9 meters, and they just are put on the Antarctic ecosystem. And when they come up, they come up with everything else along them. You can see the soft corals of Antarctica just at the back behind the fish that have come up with it as well. That's another toothfish coming up from the depths. This one's been eaten because the net was left inside for too long, so it's got predation on it, but that's what the toothfish looks like. Some Chinese vessels that I found in the Indian Ocean earlier this year, they were fishing using drift nets. Drift nets were banned back in 1992, but since there was no one looking, they were setting out these nets that ran for 40 kilometers long, and they stood 16 meters in height, which is about the height of a five-story building. And they were catching everything that comes into it. That's the photo of a critically endangered southern bluefin tuna. And then we had piles and piles of sharks because we went and confiscated the net and then we pulled it up. And in that, we had, just within a few hours, we managed to pull up about 320 animals from sharks to southern bluefin tuna to dolphins to mola molas to swordfish to an albacore tuna. We had about 11 species that came up in a couple of hours on these drift nets. And then, because there is no enforcement, the group that I represent Sea Shepherd, we go out and we use civil citizen action to confront these operations. And at times in Antarctica, we put our ships between the whaling ships and their operations, and we end up with situations where there's aggression and we get rammed. Or we chase vessels like the Thunder for 110 days, haul all its fishing gear out of Antarctica, and deliver it to uh, a situation where desperately they scuttle their ship and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean because that's the way to get rid of evidence. Or sometimes you get lucky and you work with authorities across the world who then take these vessels to task and put them out of commission. A lot of these photos are from the deep sea, a lot of what happens out there. I think all day today we've been hearing about photography in nature reserves, we've been hearing about vanishing landscapes, we've been hearing about human-animal conflict, and we've heard a bit about poaching and the illegal hunting of animals within these reserves. When I look at the fishing industry and what happens out there in the oceans, a lot of what we can photograph is inaccessible. A lot of photography that comes, comes from areas that are close to shore and possibly in the first 20 to 30 meters by divers that have a chance to go and dive in. A lot of, and that's a small, minuscule percentage of what is the real story that comes in from the deep. In terms of human-animal conflict, the oceans cover 71% of the planet, and yet we've managed to get onto vessels. The estimate right now is that there's 4.9 million fishing vessels today. We get onto these vessels and we go and create a conflict where we go in and actually take animals from there. And because there's no enforcement and because of the way the, govern the governance of the ocean works, it's overrun with poaching and illegality. So there's the deep blue that we look at with a lot of admiration and it inspires a lot of things between us. But if we go out a bit deeper and delve in, there's a lot of murky secrets that the deep blue holds. And it's time we brought that murky secret into our common consciousness and our common imagination. Because in the absence of that, there's a lot that's wrong that's going out there. And for the situation to change, we need to get up and understand the situation to be able to address it. Thank you.